Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about extending CSS with event-driven virtual style sheets. Now that's a mouthful, so I'm going to break it down for you. What do we mean by extending CSS? So by that, I mean adding new styling abilities. So this isn't something that you can polyfill with existing CSS features. We're talking about leveraging JavaScript and the built-in DOM APIs for styling. So this is styling beyond the scope of what CSS is designed to do, and probably some things that CSS will never do. Extending CSS is not replacing or re-implementing what CSS already does. It's not just adding syntactic sugar to CSS like a preprocessor, and it's not necessarily violating the separation of concerns either. So what does it mean for CSS to be event-driven? Well, CSS is already event-driven. We have events like hover and focus, active, and more. Style changes often mirror things that are happening in the browser at the time, like media queries may change when the width of the viewport changes. And style changes are often driven by events happening in JavaScript. What do I mean by virtual style sheets? A virtual style sheet is simply a dynamic style sheet that can change over time. It can use JavaScript logic for templating, it can use JavaScript logic for interpolating values, and it can be located either in HTML or CSS object model. So you have a little bit of flexibility about where you locate it as well. What are the types of virtual style sheet? You could have a style tag in HTML that is dynamically updated. You could use a custom script or template type in HTML. Or you could even link in an external file using a script tag or a link tag. And it could also be any string that JavaScript can read. So what are the places where you can add logic to styles? Well, in HTML, you can use custom attributes. Like this could be used to define a selector for JavaScript to process. It could be used to supply a test or a function. Or it could be used to assign an event or multiple events on which JavaScript should reprocess this style sheet. In CSS, you're able to use custom attribute selectors, which can be used to pass information to JavaScript. And you can also make use of CSS variables inside CSS that can be updated dynamically outside of CSS. In JavaScript, you're able to use strings, variables, and functions to supply or deal with the logic related to styling. What are some useful events for styling? Well, there are the global browser events. The ones that I found the most useful are load, resize, input, and click. And if you listen to all of those global events, it catches 95% of most of the events that you need for reprocessing CSS. However, you can add specific event listeners to individual elements as well. If you wanted to listen to an element scroll, you may add a scroll listener just to that element. Another thing you can do is add a mutation observer or a resize observer to try to get more information about when a specific element itself might be changing in the DOM. The other source of events for styling are if you're building a JavaScript-based app, the app may have its own life cycle. It may have its own updates, callbacks, yeah, even its state may be stored in JavaScript in a way that you'd be able to use for styling. Some useful tests for styling. So you can compare numbers. You can do less than, less or equal, equal, greater or equal, or greater than. And so two of those correlate to min or max. Um, there are a number of properties on most elements that you can test as well. So I found styling based on an element's offset width, height, either its text content length or value length, its children length, and its scroll position to be useful. What are the three rules of event-driven styling? Rule number one, do everything in CSS that can be done in CSS. And that means let CSS be CSS and let selectors be selectors. Rule number two, limit the number of tests being performed. This is essential, especially when you have large documents filled with many elements that may need to respond based on a very similar test. If you can get away with just performing one test for all of those elements, that's a way to increase performance. Rule number three, consolidate event listeners. 
So this is a case where you may have many different event listeners that would all end up firing at the same time anyway. If you can find a way to hook those into more global events, you can also save quite a bit of processing. So what is style scoping? Well, style scoping exists at three levels. Scoped style sheets, scoped selectors, and scoped properties. So the first one, which I'll call level one or type one style scoping, is similar to how media queries uh, wraps an entire style sheet. You might say that that is a, a conditional or a scoped style sheet. And another application of this is container queries, which are responsive breakpoints set on the width of an element that affect the element and its children. An example of level two style scoping, uh, scope selectors, would be like the has pseudoclass in CSS, uh, hover or element queries, where you're adding something onto a selector that determines its validity. This is like a JavaScript selector resolver would be a level two scope style. And the third type is similar to Internet Explorer's old expression statement. It's scoped properties or, or CSS variables or interpolating JavaScript inside the value supplied to a property in CSS. So here is a short history of how style scoping has evolved over time. CSS was first proposed in 1994, and not long after it, JavaScript style sheets were introduced by Netscape as a way to interact from JavaScript to styling. Dynamic properties, the expression statement, was introduced in Internet Explorer 5 in 1999 and stuck around until IE8. CSS media queries, which is the idea that a group of rules can be applied or not applied to the document based on the viewport's dimensions, were proposed in 2001, but it took 11 years of specification before they were finally approved. The scope pseudo class has been proposed in CSS selectors level four in 2011, and that's still in draft. We've seen support show up and disappear from some browsers in that time. And the most current thing is Houdini specifications that were proposed in 2016. These are still an active work in progress, and we're starting to see some browsers indicate or begin the work on supporting some of these specs. I'm going to talk to you about event-driven virtual style sheet plugins. So all that an EDVS plugin needs to do is load style sheets, be aware of JavaScript logic and events, populate virtual style sheets, and possibly interact with other helper functions to help extend CSS. So what is the template for a basic event-driven virtual style sheet plugin? So this is the pattern that I'm probably the most fond of right now. It's a function that I've called JS and CSS. It looks for a tag to populate. If it doesn't find it, it creates it. Then you can see the inner HTML here is our dynamic style sheet. There's a CSS style sheet with JavaScript interpolated right into it, inner width and inner height. So normally this would just do nothing, but we have added an event listener for load, resize, input, and click, those four global events that cover most things. And so when the page first loads, this virtual style sheet is going to get rendered with the value of inner width and inner height at the time. But if we change the size of the browser, those numbers are no longer accurate. But since we've added an event listener for the resize event, it will reprocess that virtual style sheet every time the resize event fires, which means it will always have the current up-to-date inner width and inner height. So what is it doing? Find or create a style tag to populate, hold CSS as a template string to be interpolated, add event listeners to trigger style sheet reprocessing. The average size of an EDVS plugin is around 100 lines of code. I've written about 15 of these, uh, ones that work in HTML, ones that work in CSS, ones that work in JavaScript, and in general, they're not very large. What is an event-driven virtual style sheet mix-in? So 
The cool thing is that most of these helper functions can be used interchangeably with most EDVS plugins. So you can search and modify the DOM, return a string of CSS to the plugin, and the design of these is borrowed from Unix philosophy. Uh, these are text-based, they're returning strings of CSS, and they're acting as a filter. So you're sending it one thing, it creates a change, and then it sends text back. You could even daisy chain the output from one plugin through another plugin, although I, I guess you'd lose a little bit of performance each time you do that. I haven't done that uh, for any benefit, but it, it should be possible as long as you're adhering to this philosophy. So is there a template for a basic EDVS mixin? This function has most of the hallmarks of most of the mixins that I've created. It's a JavaScript function. You supply a selector, a rule or style sheet, and as many other arguments as you need in order to compute the styles. You search the document for the selector, and for each tag that's returned, you can test it, you can assign a unique identifier, and you can output CSS written or rewritten for those unique identifiers. So this is a very powerful and easy to extend pattern that you can use to create element queries or container queries, to implement a parent selector, to implement an aspect ratio property, anything that you can dream up you're probably going to start with something like this and extend it into what you need. So what is it doing? It's finding all the tags in the document matching a selector, assigning a unique attribute to matching tags, generating CSS targeting those unique attributes, and returning CSS as a string. We can extend it by adding any JS logic we need to help us decide which tags we need to style. The average size of an EDVS mixin is around 20 lines of code, these helper functions are tiny, but the things that they add to CSS are huge. So, to recap, it doesn't take much code to conceive of new ways of thinking about design. It doesn't take much code to define a comfortable syntax for describing styles to solve whatever design challenge or problem you're trying to solve. It also doesn't take much code to implement all of this within your desired workflow and tooling, whether you want to write this from inside HTML, whether you want to think about these as separate external files that get loaded into your project, or whether it's something that's stored in a JavaScript aware format like JSON and just loaded directly from JavaScript to JavaScript, you can implement these concepts very simply to suit whatever workflow you prefer. And the other exciting thing is that a lot of these ideas that I've shown you, I've gotten to work in very old browsers. I have container queries working with the JS and CSS pattern in Internet Explorer 6, 7, and 8, and of course every browser since then. So if you're looking to extend CSS, you can not only use some of these cutting edge features that CSS doesn't yet have or might never have, but you should be able to use them in every browser that you ever need to use them in already without relying on Houdini or Resize Observer or any new additional technology to come out. This power is here today. You just have to use the platform.